Lust Hills Wild Ones is honored and proud to be a part of the Siouxland Garden Show. We are co-sponsors of two outstanding speakers. Benjamin Vogt, who is an author and garden designer who lives in Nebraska. He speaks nationally on garden design and landscape ethics at conferences and seminars. And Doug Tallamy, who is a familiar name to many worldwide, encouraging each of us in our own spaces to become a part of growing a homegrown national park. You can source plants for these nature gardens by going to lusthills.wildwinds.org and clicking on the 2021 plant sale list. There you will find stunning photos and details of these native plants. Lust Hills Wild Ones also hosts classes, field trips, a complimentary fall seed exchange, and many more fun and educational activities. Come join us and add some wild to your spaces. We can't wait to meet you. Hi everyone, welcome back to the Virtual Siouxland Garden Show. Uh, we're excited to be kicking off session four of two of the session. So I'm gonna go ahead and get the PowerPoint up here for our little welcome. Just a reminder to go ahead and join us in the comments. Uh, we'd love to know where you're joining us from. We had the opportunity to kind of uh, promote this nationwide. So we'd love to see if we're bringing in any uh, folks from around the country. Um, and also feel free to let us know if you're a master gardener. Um, it's going to be the easiest to comment on Facebook Live. So if you're watching on our website, have a Facebook account. There's a direct link on the website that can take you to the Facebook page. Um, so if you have any um, comments that come up or questions that you might have for Benjamin, uh, feel free to put them into the comments. Um, we'll also have an opportunity on the evaluation for you to go ahead and fill that out and then also ask questions for Benjamin there if you didn't get an opportunity to ask any in the comments. Um, you can ask questions throughout and we'll have time at the end of the session where Benjamin will uh, get the opportunity to answer those for you. Just a reminder on all the sessions that are coming up, we're going to be doing the Siouxland Garden Show um, until March 26th, every Friday at um, 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. Um, so next week we're looking at um, some landscaping and some winter care of apples and cherry trees. Uh, so it's just some fun things to look forward to. You can always find all this information on the Siouxland Garden Show website if you're interested. And of course, I have to acknowledge the awesome Siouxland Garden Show committee that uh, helps put together this virtual event as well as our in-person events. Uh, this is a collaborative effort between Iowa State University Extension and Outreach in Woodbury County as well as Nebraska Extension in Dakota County. So we've been very excited to work together and the planning of all of our garden shows. This is technically our, I think our 16th uh, garden show. So uh, year two of us hosting it virtual. Um, so it's been very fun. We have Carrie King, Carol Larvik, Molly Hewitt, myself, Caitlin Brinkerhoff, Kevin Potabom, Emily Yaki, and the bottom three are master gardeners that help us out on the committee as well. We have Rex Towns, Randy Burnite, and Diana Kincaid. Uh, we'd love for you guys to go ahead and save the date for our 2022 show. Um, it's going to be in person, fingers crossed, um, April 2nd and April 3rd. So it's a Friday and a Saturday. We're going to be at the Marriott Hotel Center in South Sioux City, Nebraska. Uh, two days for you guys to come out, listen to educational sessions, um, shop with some great garden vendors, meet master gardeners, um, and just enjoy uh, two full days of fun gardening. Um, a mission for the in-person show is $5 a day, um, but just a reminder that our virtual sessions are free. Of course, I have to say a big thank you to all of our volunteers and vendors. We have over 70 Master Gardener volunteers that help us put on the Siouxland Garden Show every year. Um, so we're really sad not to be in person and enjoying all the fun, um, but we're looking forward to 2022. And then we also have over 40 uh, garden vendors that come out um, and provide education to folks and um, just some fun shopping experiences. So we're really looking forward to 2022 um, and hoping to be back in person. And another thank you to our sponsors. Today's uh, session is actually sponsored by Les Hills Wild Ones. Um, so we're really excited to be working with them um, and looking forward to their other session that they're going to be sponsoring later on as well. All right, so we are going to go ahead and get Benjamin up on the screen here. And Benjamin, whenever you are ready for your PowerPoint, I will go ahead and add it to the screen here. I think it should be good to go. Awesome. 
All right, so we have it up on the screen for you and I'll go ahead and take my camera down and the stage is yours. All right, thank you everybody for joining me today. The snow is melting, spring is within hours, right? Um, and, you know, I used to work at a blanket factory, but it folded, so everything is different for me. Everybody's laughing. Okay, let's go. So we're going to talk. We're going to bust. Uh, we're going to bust ten garden management maintenance and creation myths today. So I hope you're ready. Uh, traditional landscaping. This is basically how I think of traditional landscaping. This isn't necessarily. All these things aren't necessarily performed or done, but this, you know, I'm trying to get a big picture. Uh, we'll amend our soil or bring in soil to the site to improve it, quote unquote. Uh, most of our plants will be in about the one gallon size and they'll be masked by species. So you'll have five of this here, five of this there. We'll also unfortunately have the tendency to have our plants spread way too far apart than what we would see in nature. And I would love to see us stop using weed barrier. Weed barrier is still used a lot. Unfortunately, weeds love to grow on top of it, and it's a pain to dig into. And then we do use too much wood mulch, usually three to four inches. If you have clay soil, one to two is fine. But later on, we're going to talk about some wood mulch alternatives. And then we do have a tendency to, uh, in traditional landscaping, to fertilize probably over fertilize, fertilize when we don't need to, um, whether that's annually or during the year. Traditional landscaping tends to look a lot like this. Um, you can see the plants are spread very far apart and the foundation beds are very thin and very narrow and there's a lot of lawn there. So my hope is that together, either today or down the road, we can get away from a look that's like this to a look that's more like this, which is actually going to be a lot lower maintenance, believe it or not. Um, the space is just mowed down one, one time a year, and that's about it, maybe adding some plants in the fall. Um, one of the reasons you want to see a landscape like this is because you want to see wildlife like this tiger swallowtail, right? You're not going to get nearly as much wildlife um, in, in that first landscape that we looked at two slides ago. So are you ready? The ride begins. I hope you've all paid. You have to be this tall to ride the ride. So our first myth that we're going to bust is that you need to amend soil. Well, there is no perfect garden soil. We have this idea, I think, in gardening, horticulture, landscaping, that a perfect soil is that loamy, crumbly stuff that smells really earthy and just pours out of your hand in this beautiful, elegant, sensual way. Nah. No, we don't want to amend the soil. We want to work with the soil that's there. Um, a lot of times, this is different than, you know, if you have a vegetable garden, you're certainly going to want to be amending, right? That's a whole different ball of wax than ornamental flower gardening using native plants. So when we do amend our soil, we tend to use um, tillers. But tilling destroys soil structure, most of the soil life, and brings weed seeds to the surface that have been buried uh, under, underneath the ground. Um, and then all that fresh soil on the top that's been, you know, all the amendments that have been tilled into there, you know, weed seeds are going to be blowing in and thinking, oh, man, this is awesome. This is great. This is the perfect condition for me to grow. We want to match our plants to the site, right? So we need to be thinking about what kind of soil is already there. What is the drainage already like there? What is the light like? And what is the plant competition going to be like? Because when we're creating sustainable, natural gardens, we're having very thick and lush beds, and the plants are really close together. And you want that closeness because that's how it is in nature. So what are the plants around them? How are they going to compete? Are some aggressive? Are some not as aggressive? Uh, will they work well together? And not just aesthetically, but you know, practically. So the second myth that we're going to bust is spring planting is best. Um, garden centers want us to think this for sure. That's when most of their seals are made and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but for the plants, spring planting might not always be the best. There are some species that even do better planted in the fall. So if you're planting in the spring, new plants are going to face the stress of summer heat and summer drought almost immediately. I remember I was installing some gardens for some clients just, I think, two years ago, and it was 105 in the first week of May. So we completely lost our spring planting window and probably should have just said, hey, you know what? The smart thing for the plants would be to wait until September. So the plants, if you're going to plant in spring, the plants are probably going to slow down or be knocked back because it's going to be getting hot really soon. And it's going to leave more time and space for weeds to establish. We want plants to grow and fill in really quickly because we want them to, to out-compete the weeds really quickly. 
just like in this landscape here. Pretty thick, pretty lush. Granted, this is fall. I confess to fall being my favorite time of year, but... So fall, fall, fall provides cooler temps, more rain, definitely a lot less weed competition. Most of our weeds, and, and we're talking annuals, because that's mostly what you're going to see in a new garden bed. They're going to be shutting down. They're, they're going to be done by the beginning of September for the most part. Um, so if you're planting in the fall, those plants are going to root out in the fall, in the winter, before the soil freezes, and then they're going to they're going to leap in the spring. So they're almost going to have a one-year head start um, if you would have waited until next spring. So plant in the fall is what I'm saying. Our third myth goes back to the beginning with fertilization. So if our plants are sited correctly, they're not going to need supplemental inputs like fertilizer. So if, if you're really, really concerned about what, what your soil type is, what's going on in your soil, do a soil test. And that's maybe a smart thing to do anyway. Um, you certainly can do that for vegetable gardens. And if you do that for um, ornamental flower beds, there is no harm in that and only good things to learn from. So don't change the site for the plants. Change the plants for the site. Adapt, because you want your plants to adapt. So here's an example of doing a soil test. It's pretty easy. There's companies everywhere that you can drop your soil sample, soil sample off at. So fertilizer may actually weaken plants that prefer leaner conditions. I'm thinking, this is going to be a little bit of a tangent, but I'm thinking about some of our native prairie plants that we bring into our home gardens. Now, a home garden is always going to be a more pampered space just by default. There's not going to be nearly as much as much plant competition and, and weather you know, above and, and below the soil line. So something like a stiff goldenrod is going to be a lot taller when you put it in your home garden because there's just, there's just less stress on it. It's going to be, oh, man, this is awesome. I'm going to grow four feet tall, whereas out in the prairie, I was two feet tall. Um, we're all very familiar with coneflower. It does not like a, a, a rich soil. It likes that leaner um, clay soil. So if you plant it in a bed that has that really rich, loamy soil, the thing's going to shoot up 8,000 feet, flop over, and be dead within a year or two. Its, it's longevity just isn't going to be there like it would be out in the wild. Now, another negative about fertilizing is that fertilizer is very resource intensive to produce. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of water, a lot of fossil fuel, fuels are being used. And then when you put it out in your landscape, it can uh, off gas toxic substances into the air or leach into the groundwater. And we certainly don't want that. Okay, we are hopping right along. This is our fourth myth that we're going to be busting. Water regularly. I cannot tell you how many of my clients water way too much. I once had a client who wanted a very drought tolerant garden because because they didn't want to um, fuss and mess with it so much. They wanted it to be very low maintenance. So I'm like, okay, awesome. I love it. We're going to have fun with this. We're going to use all drought tolerant native plants. And what happened? They watered those plants to death, right? So when your plants are matched to site, you're not going to need extra irrigation after establishment. We definitely, we've all grown up with, you gotta fertilize, you gotta mulch, you gotta, you gotta water once a week. And that's not necessarily the case. It often isn't the case if you're correctly matching your plants to your site conditions. So in the gardens that I'm installing, we're using plugs, so very small plants. We'll take a picture, we'll look, we'll look at a picture of plugs pretty soon, but and, you know, just a few weeks, maybe a month of watering for plugs and a month or two for seeds is generally enough for woody plants. It depends on, on how large they are, how, how large their root ball is, um, and, and the weather conditions, of course, how much rain you're getting, how hot it is, how cool it is, how windy it is. But for woody plants, it could be a couple months to a year or two before they're fully established. There are certainly some woody plants out there that are just like, man, just stick me in the ground, leave me alone, I'm cool, let's go. So overwatering, especially in clay soil, and we, I think we all pretty much have clay soil, that's going to suffocate your roots. So infrequent deep watering is almost, almost always better if you, if you have to water. Even in really dry conditions, I remember back in, God, what was that, 2012, before the end times, well before the end times, 2012, where we had a year where we had like maybe half an inch of rain from June, July, and August, it, 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 was, it was ridiculous. But I never had to water my garden, and it looked good the entire year. It was a little beaten up, but you know, plants all came back fine the next year. All right, wood mulch. This one, I bet, is going to be hard. <laughs> it sometimes is. Mulch actually keeps plants in a perpetual state of establishment. 
So what that means is it's preventing plants from self-sowing and, and reproducing. And we want plants. We actually want our plants to self-sow and fill in to give us free plants, at, you know, to shade the ground, to shade out and out-compete weeds and get that ecological community that can support wildlife going a lot sooner. 70% of our native bees nest in open soil. So what are they going to do when you have mulch over your soil? They're going to be in trouble. It's better if they can weave their way down flowers in your sedges and your grasses and, and find their hole where the young are. And again, please don't use weed barrier fabric. It's a waste of money and you're going to you're going to have a fun time pulling it in a couple of years when you realize it was a waste of money. I remember, gosh, when I was young, my, 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 my mom and dad uh, around, around their landscape, they had this weed fabric. And my mom would make me come outside to help her dig. And we would spend 10 minutes trying to cut a circle with the scissors through the rock, rock mulch that we had on top. And I'm pretty sure I lost a couple of fingers through that rock, through those scissors. That's your story for the day. Hope you enjoyed it. So here's an example of two high-maintenance beds. <laughs> You're probably thinking, oh, that looks pretty easy, right? But these are going to be seen mulch applications every year, fertilizer applications, uh, pre-emergent herbicide applications every year. That bed on the left is actually outside a health clinic. Um, I don't know if I'd want to go into that health clinic after seeing that bed. I want to see flowers and butterflies in life, something that encourages me and lifts my spirits. This is actually an early photo from my main backyard garden. This is not how to establish a garden. This was like, uh, got 15 yards of wood mulch or something. Um, it's great for building a little bit of the, uh, re rebuilding the clay soil a little bit because it had all been scraped off from the build of the new home, um, but it needs more plants. This is a, a little bit better. This is how I started in my front yard. Um, there's, there's, there's a few more plants that are a little closer together, but really they're not, there's not, just, just not enough plants and they're not close enough together. So I was fighting weeds for at least two to three years when I should have only been fighting them for one year. Speaking of wood mulch and other wood mulch applications, um, don't do your tree volcanoes, right? You just want to have an inch or two around the tree, maybe three inches and don't pile it up against the trunk. I hope everybody knows that because you're going to kill the tree. One of the myths I hear a lot is that I want to use mulch. Okay, you're telling me not to use mulch. You want me to use plants to uh, overcome weeds, but doesn't mulch fight weeds? Yes and no. A thin layer of mulch, maybe one to two inches. So you've got a new bed. You put in all of your plugs and your plants, hopefully just 12 inches apart from each other because you want to get that coverage really soon. And you come in and you just put in maybe an inch or two, probably an inch of mulch. And that will help... Um, beat back some of those annual weeds the first year. Um, you might still have some perennial weeds in there, but by year two and year three, the mulch is degrading. The plants are taking over the role of the mulch and everything becomes beautiful, right? Because you want those plants to take over, self-sow, start spreading. So basically what we're talking about is, is green mulch, plants. Green mulch equals more plants, equals healthier, more sustainable um, ecosystems that are less work and less maintenance and less management over time. In general, every site is different. We're always going to have caveats. We're always going to have to adapt and evolve. What do you think? I'm thinking a thumbs up here. This is my front yard, so you cannot think it's ugly. So the plants are all tied together. There's a matrix of, of grasses and sedges underneath all these perennials that are flowering at different times of year. This fog only lasted like five minutes. So I knew when I saw it, I was just like, my toddler's got to stay in bed. I don't have time to mess with it. I got to get outside and take a picture of this. One of my favorite pictures. This is a client's garden where we used five or six different species of sedge. Um, sedge, Carex, C-A-R-E-X. We have so many native sedge species. This is a mostly shady garden. Um, so the sedge is, is the living green mulch. Um, we didn't even put any mulch in here. Uh, we have, so this is just the first year. So a lot of the flowering perennials and spring ephemerals are not really full grown yet. So that's going to take them a year, two or three to really get going. But flowers are going to be coming up through this in masses and drifts. All right, our sixth myth that we're going to bust is trusting plant tags. Plant tags are untrustworthy. <laughs> There's never enough info on a small tag and it's not ever hardly ever going to be tailored to your zip code and it's certainly not going to be tailored to your specific site conditions around your home. It's not going to tell us what the mature size is um, and we're talking you know more than three to five years more than more than one to two years. I want to know what the plant's going to be doing in six, seven, eight, ten years. 
Uh, that's what's really going to help me. I can't tell you how many times I planted a, a tree or, or a perennial or something. It just got way too big for that space um, far down the road. Plant tag isn't going to tell you too much about soil and drainage. It might, it might say it likes it dry, but what does that mean? Dry clay, dry lust, dry loam, dry sand, dry rocky. A lot of different things. Reproduction method. It's important to know how your plants are going to reproduce. Are they going to do it? aggressively and easily? Or are they going to be nice behaved clumpers? Do they spread by roots? Uh, do they spread by seed? How far does that seed go? Does it just fall around the mother plant? And so you have that nice clump of, of plants that looks nice and tidy? Or is the seed going to be flying all over your landscape and you're going to have plants popping up and uh, popping up in places that you don't want to see them? And then there's also a root zone to think about. Um, you'd usually, I mean, you you can really go down a rabbit hole when you're thinking about root zone, but I try to not have fibrous uh, rooted plants next to each other necessarily. So um, I'm thinking something like, um, you know, when you plant an echinacea um, that's got that long, deep tap root amongst a bed of little blue stem, a cytos grama, the, the grasses are going to have these fibrous roots and that cone flower is going to have a tap root that's going down. So they're not competing at the same resource level in the soil, soil so they're all going to be happy. So yeah, not enough information here. There's relevant information, but it's just never going to be enough for you. So you need to do a little bit more research. You've probably heard that old gardening adage, uh, adage uh, dig a $10 hole for a $1 plant. Well, I want you to spend at least 10 minutes researching a plant before you spend one minute putting it in the ground. Some of my favorite resources to learn about plants, their behavior, their spread, the site conditions they do well in, do best in, are the Illinois Wildflowers website, Missouri Botanics and Wildflower Center, the USDA plant database, and my new favorite, BONAP, Biota of North America program. Of course, we have lots of wonderful uh, extension websites, Nebraska, Iowa, here in the Midwest and the Plains that will have a lot of good information for you as well. All right, number seven, garden by USD hardiness zone. This might be up there with mulch, maybe. I'm just guessing. So the reason why I find gardening by USD hardiness zone problematic is that it only shows minimum winter temperatures. So it's only showing you, um, is that plant going to survive if it gets down to minus 20 in a zone 5 or minus 10 in a zone 6? So what I want you to think about using and researching is USDA, I guess it's actually EPA, ecoregion map. So they're going to be telling you about the soil and hydrology that plant is going to do well in, the summer high temps. Frankly, I'm more curious in, in, in how the plant's going to do in July and August, especially with climate change. Things are just getting hotter and drier. Um, and it's, when you go to the ecoregion map, you can start to learn more about ecological community. You can do that with the BONAP website as well. So just tie those two together in your mind. Um, you'll learn about wildlife support. So here is the USDA plant hardiness zone map. You can't, you can't tell me now that South Carolina has much in common with Oregon, but they have the same zones. So even, even if you have a native plant species um, that is native to both areas, they're going to be performing very differently and expecting very different things, which is probably, we could go on a side tangent of talking about local genotype or local or regional ecotype, see where you're trying to get plants that um, you know, have, have, have evolved in your specific region. And your specific region looks like this. There are three levels to the EPA ecoregion map. So this is the, this is the most anal retentive, I'm an ecologist level. Probably level three would be, uh, be the best for most gardeners. But this is about as specific as we can get. So I'm looking. I don't know where you are, but I know where I am. I'm in Lincoln, Nebraska. So I'm in some nice orange there in the southeast Nebraska there. So that's my ecoregion. So I need to be researching plants that are native to that area that evolved together, that evolved in that environment and climate. That's going to give me the lowest maintenance possible and the best chance at success in my landscape. So that was a lot, but we can talk more about that later. And I certainly have a lot of uh, resources. So our eighth myth that we're going to look at is bigger plants establish sooner. I do not want you to spend more money than you have to. I'm pretty sure you and your spouses don't want you to spend more money than you have to either. Raise your hand if you have snuck plants home in your car and hid them somewhere in your landscape so your spouse couldn't see that you spent more money on plants, right? So when you have a bigger plant, you're going to have more roots 
and you're going to have more shock when you put it into the ground. It's going to be longer to independence and it's going to need more TLC. I have colleagues out there in the gardening world who will take their bald and burlap or their, or their big potted trees and shrubs and they will wash all that soil away from the roots and then plant it bare root into the soil right away. Um, I hear that works fantastically. I just don't have enough guts to try that myself, especially in client landscapes where they're paying me good money. Um, but you certainly do want to rough up those root balls really well and get the roots reaching out into your native soil. And don't amend the soil in that planting hole, whether that's a coneflower planting hole or whether it's an oak tree planting hole. Get, you want the native soil around those roots so they're all, so and that way the plant will establish a lot more effectively. And even consider not staking your tree if you're doing a tree. Um, the tree is going to root out stronger and sooner if it's able to wave and, and uh, to, to sway in the wind a little bit more. If you're on a super windy site or a slope, stake away for just a year. I have found in my experience that smaller trees establish just as fast as those large three and four hundred dollar trees that have two or three inch caliper trunks on them. So think about using a tree that's got you know half inch or one inch caliper or uh, less actually something that's maybe five or six feet tall. You will find that in five years that, that five or six foot tall tree will be just as tall as the three or four hundred dollar tree you planted twenty feet away. So when we're doing gardens, we're using plugs and two inch pots almost exclusively when we're working with sedges and grasses, though I will also sew in some um, grasses and annual forbs. So you can see here we have sedge, are those plugs there, the open bare soil you can see, and then two inch pots there for, it looks like that's allium cernuum nodding onion right there. So this is what we're doing. We're just using a soil knife. So. Soil knife is like the best tool you can possibly have in your arsenal, especially if you're in clay soil. It's so sharp, you just stab it in the, in the soil, make a circle, pop out the dirt, pop in the plant, and you're done. It's not that easy. All right, number nine myth, clean up the garden in fall. I bet most of you don't do this anymore. We've been hearing about this a lot in the news and on social media um, pages for, for gardens and, and for wildlife. Uh, we want to leave the plant standing in the winter because stems are going to gather snow to insulate their crowns and it's also going to increase soil moisture which which we absolutely want i am so thankful that we've had a record god what are we up at, at here in lincoln nebraska we've had 50 inches of snow i think this year so twice as much as usual i'm so thankful for it because our ponds and streams were just <laughs> maybe an inch deep it felt like last year so i'm so happy to have this moisture back around um, our stems are also going to be bee habitat especially in the spring talk about that in a second. Leaves improve soil and provide cover for wildlife. Well, all the plants are going to be doing that. Uh, I love looking outside in a winter snowstorm and seeing birds taking shelter under my switchgrass and little blue stem. Warms my heart even though I know they're freezing. Seed heads, um, leave those up. For, you know, that's, that's bird food for winter. And you know what? There are so many native plants that have just stunning seed heads on them. Um, I want to, I want to see more people using less Bediza capita, capitata, round-headed bush clover. I wish I had a picture for that. Um, you know, obviously coneflowers and our rudbeckias, uh, rattlesnake master, even our grasses look good in winter. There's so much that looks good. I don't want to look out into my backyard or my front yard in the middle of winter and see the six inch tall moonscape. <laughs> and I don't think you want to either. Wildlife certainly don't want to see that. Leave it up for winter. See, isn't this much more beautiful than something that's been mowed down and eradicated? Everybody's nodding their head yes. I can see you. Be a litter bug. Leave those leaves in your bed. You got leaves on your lawn, mulch them up, put them back on the lawn, or rake them up and put them in your garden beds. There's going to be all kinds of, of, of wildlife. You know, There's going to be morning cloak butterflies who overwinter as adults underneath this leaf, this leaf litter. There's going to be frogs. There's going to be spiders. There's going to be beetles. Um, even queen bumblebees won't go very far. They might not even go into the soil. They're just going to a really dense, thick, piled up brush or leaf pile to hibernate for the winter. So yeah, leave those stems high when you cut down the garden in spring. I think we're getting pretty close to cut down. I usually tell people, wait until we have highs that are consistently in the 50s. And we're already looking at the 50s in, in next week. So that's about the time when you want to cut your garden back. Leave stems 12 to 18 inches tall. 
Um, depends on how tall your plant is. Something like an ironweed, you could leave 18 inches tall, or a Joe Pie weed. Um, this is evidence right here of a native, one of those, one of our small native carpenter bees that are digging the pith out of the stem of this plant here. That's that white material on the leaf. Making homes for their babies every year. There's that male car. There's a carpenter bee on the left. It's a male. It's actually looking for some action, I think. There's probably a female down in that stem. That's a Joe Pye stem, so you troke him. And there's a goldfinch gorging on sunflowers to the right. All right, our 10th myth. Lawns are easier than flower gardens. I don't buy that. Lawns equals weekly mowing, two to three or four times per year fertilizing, um, all the radio and TV commercials I say say uh, I, I see say that you should be fertilizing your lawn four times a year, which is crazy. Even fertilizing, I see people fertilizing their lawn in the fall, and I think, why are you doing that? Your fall is getting ready to go. Your, your lawn's getting ready to go dormant. That stuff's just going to sit there and wash off over the winter and go down the storm drain. So you're mowing weekly, you're watering weekly, or in the case of some of my neighbors, you're watering every darn morning and you're starting to create puddles uh, of water atop your clay soil that doesn't drain well because those lawn roots only go down a few inches. Now plant flower beds uh, where we have lush layered um, uh, areas of plants that have roots going down six, ten feet down, all you really have to do is cut them down in the spring. You don't need to use fertilizer. You don't need to bring mulch in if you have things planted on 12 inch centers and you're letting things self sow a little bit. And I do most of my, my planting in the fall uh, in my gardens. Number one, that's just when I have a little bit more time after a busy uh, landscaping season. Um, but again, all, it's, 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 it's also just easier on the plants and it's easier on me. I, I really don't like digging outside in anything above 50 degrees. Oh, he didn't just say that, did he? Yes, he did. 50 to 60 degrees is my optimum planting temperature for myself. And, and the plants don't mind it either. So for me, you know, I watch my neighbors mowing every week. They're out there an hour, an hour and a half. And I'm just, you know, I'm just sitting in my flower, flower beds watching the bees, having a good time. We have to get away from landscapes like this. This is a high maintenance landscape. Sure, the lawn is green and lush and beautiful, but it's really not doing much for us. And it's certainly not doing much for wildlife or any, any sort of ecosystem function. The most it's doing is probably preventing a little bit of runoff. That's about it. But we can have native, native prairie beds, lush um, garden beds doing that same sort of work, but then having far more ecosystem function uh, for wildlife and for um, cleaning soil, cleaning the air, cleaning water that's coming off the street, all that good stuff. I often use pictures in my front yard, and there it is. So there's one picture. Um, so that's another angle. You saw, you saw it from the other angle earlier. There's Rattlesnake Master. That is an underplanted, native, gorgeous, wonderful, blooms for like three or four weeks, um, wonderful seed heads. Nice fall color, actually, you know. Our forbs have a lot of good fall color. We shouldn't discount them. And our grasses, of course. It's not just trees and shrubs that have fall color. We can have fall color all the way from the top all the way down to the ground. So here's a huge one acre lot and we are converting part of it into designed prairie gardens. Less long wherever you can do it, right? This is what it looked like um, just less than a year later. I do detect a monarch wing over there behind the red milkweed, Asclepius incarnata, so that's wonderful. So what we did here, I might as well just go ahead and give you some more bonus information. Uh, what we did here was kill the lawn plant straight into the lawn um, with, 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 with the flower plugs. So we were drifting and massing the flower plugs, um, how, how we wanted them to grow and develop. And then I came in, so we did that in the fall. And then the next spring I came in and I sewed in side oats grama, which is going to be our living green mulch from which all of the flowers are going to be emerging from. We had very, very few weeds in, in, in this bed. I was actually kind of surprised because we did another large bed right to the right. You can see the yellow flowers there in the distance. Um, we just 100% seeded that, and we had a lot more issues with weeds and had to keep mowing it throughout the first year, which is something you're going to do often um, when you're just sowing seeds in a bed. That's going to get me some questions, I bet. 
Hey, a bonus, number 11. I said I was going to give you 10 garden ma management myths. We're going to do 11. Um, I've been hearing a lot lately, native plants are less work. People will say, hey, just use native plants. They're easier. No, they're not. <laughs> All plants have to be properly cited, whether they're native or exotic. It doesn't, it's a, it, it, just, it just doesn't matter. You have to do the research and the work to know what your plant's going to like. You know, what, what are the best chances for it to survive and thrive? So Culver's root, for example, that's not going to work in dry sand. It likes, it likes more moist, maybe medium soil conditions in clay or loam or something like that. It's not going to work in sand. It's going to die. Same thing with butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa, orange butterfly weed. Uh, you don't want to be planted that in a moist clay site. That thing is not going to last very long. But both of those plants are native, right? But that doesn't mean they're low maintenance and easy and low care. You have to cite them correctly. There's your culver's root. That's underplanted too. And there's your Asclepias tuberosa with a wonderful bee on it. Thus concludes my talk. Yimby, yes, in my backyard. So more plants in your backyard and more research on those plants. So you make sure that you are doing a good job at creating a low management space for yourself and a space that is welcoming to all types of wildlife. Awesome. So I'll go ahead and give you an opportunity, Benjamin, that you can switch screens over for you. All right, I'm and there. We have one question in so far, so I'm going to go ahead and pop that onto the screen. And then if others have questions, feel free to go ahead and put those into the comments right now. Shaded dry, fight, dry, dry site to fill the bottom border. All right. Well, I wonder how, I guess it depends on how high you want to go. Uh, most of our shade plants are going to like it like it short. I'm thinking, and it also depends on how large your 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 site is, what the soil conditions are like. So I'm just going to throw plants out there that may or may not work in, in a shady condition like this. So, um, and I'm going to give you common names, even though I want to give you the scientific name, calico aster. I give you the scientific name anyway. Somebody should spell this out. Can I spell it out over here? Yeah, um, if you go into the comments spot there, uh, Benjamin, you can actually uh, type right into it if you want. Okay, enjoy my gray hair as I bend over the keyboard. I hope I don't make any spelling errors. Do we have any other questions? Uh, nothing yet. So while we wait for okay, questions, I'll take my time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just... Uh, Share my screen to let everyone know where they can uh, find the evaluation for today's session. So if you are on the Sulin Garden Show website and watching directly from there, you guys can go um, to the speakers tab. And if you go down to uh, Benjamin's session, if you click that, you can find the direct link to the evaluation. So if you click that, it will take you to a new tab uh, where you can fill out his evaluation. Oh, looks like I we got that. a few more questions in. Oh, I'm almost done typing thalactrum. <laughs> no worries. Oh, it it is hard to remember these scientific names, but they're so much more accurate, guys. Do not be shy using scientific names when you're researching plant names, plants on on, on the internet. Please use the scientific names. You're going to get far more accurate information because common names could apply to a bunch of different species. All right, so is that up there? Yep, so I'll go ahead and take that and put it over into the uh, Facebook chat here. And we do have a couple more questions that came in. Oh, that's a great question. When you mow your front yard, do you clean it off or leave it to decay? Uh, yeah, with the front yard, I'm just, I, I've, I've got a rechargeable mower that I use about three times a year. <laughs> much to the chagrin of my neighbors, I think. But yeah, I'm just going over on the highest setting. So as high as I can get it off the ground, I'm just mowing, mulching, mulch mowing back into the space. So you're basically giving the plants all the fertilizer they will ever need. It's it's themselves, essentially. Now, in my backyard, I have a much, uh, a much denser landscape that's becoming grass dominated. And I don't mulch mow that. I'm bagging everything. And I even go through that 2,000 square foot uh, square feet and hand rake 
um, all the material out of there so I can get flower seeds to germinate a little bit more easy, easily because the sunlight's able to hit them um, versus if I would have just mulched everything back onto the side, it would cover all the weed seed, I mean, all the flower seeds. If you want any more puns, let me know too in the questions. <laughs> got steve with what about yeah. leaving plant material on the ground i think i think that's the same thing so i'm i am so i'm not necessarily mowing down everything in some areas of the garden i'm just clipping at about 12 inches off the ground with a hedge trimmer sometimes with a with a scissors or loppers or something because i want to leave some of that uh, bee habitat for the 30 percent of our bees who nest in hollow stems um, so i want to leave some of those stems tall so i'm just taking that and maybe i'm breaking it up a little bit um, and, and then just throwing that back down onto the ground. So it's very, it's a very messy way to do it, but in a couple of weeks, you're not going to be able to see it. It's not as pretty as a, as, as this, you know, nice wood mulch layer. That's all, that all is the same color and same uniformity, but you can't see it in a couple of weeks because all the plants have, have just grown over them and, and covered it up. Hitchhikers. Yeah. Jumping worms. Well, I've never had to deal with jumping worms. <laughs> uh, some of you guys might know, might, might know more about jumping worms, but um, I don't know. I don't know. I think I should let the extension people answer this question. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I guess there always could be issues when you're bringing in soil from somebody else's site. You don't, you don't necessarily know what's in that soil. It's not like when you buy it at a nursery and they have to, you know, they have to make sure that their growing medium is, is, is clean and safe and all that good stuff. So you don't know what kind of weed seeds or, or fungus or stuff you're bringing in. So that is something to be aware of. I don't know how you could ever know unless you have your own soil lab in your basement. Um, that's my answer. I don't know if it's a good one. What natives will crowd out ickies like broom, creeping bellflower, bouncing? Oh gosh. That's a question I can't answer. I think I think when you have something like brome, I think you really have to be aggressive with trying to eradicate it first. Um, not you know, otherwise, otherwise you're just going to have to research your species and think, okay, which one of these native plant species is, gonna, is going to grow aggressively in these specific site conditions that can compete with brome? I don't know how much can compete with brome unless you're mowing it or disking it or spraying it or just trying to knock it back over a year or two. Um, but you definitely want to be using native species that are self-sowing a lot. So, you know, heath aster self-sows a lot, Mexican hat, coneflower, uh, black-eyed Susan. And then you want certainly plants that are going to have very aggressive runners, maybe our mountain mints, pycnathum. Um, but really, you're going to have to, you're, you, have, you have to know your site and you have to know your plants a little bit more. And I just don't want to guess too much more than that. I will say I dealt with a site that had creeping Charlie a couple years ago. We tried everything, um, spraying glyphosate on it, putting plastic tarp on it. Stuff just came back with a vengeance no matter what we did. So I just went in there and we just decided to plant and see what would happen. And luckily, um, with our side oats grandma as our living green mulch, it outcompeted the, the creeping Charlie pretty well. Actually, I was quite surprised to see that. Uh, we have we have very little infiltration now with creeping Charlie. Care to share your opinion about dandelions? Oh, you know, I feel like somebody <laughs> knows about my opinion about dandelions. Um, Nothing wrong with dandelions. We do have dandel native dandelions, but I'm sure we're talking about the European Asian dandelion. Um, I can't remember the scientific name on that. T O. Those are the anyway. Yes, let's leave our dandelions alone. Let's not spray them away. But let's let's never ever assume or think that they are beneficial for pollinators because they're really not. You're not going to see very much using them. Um, their their nectar quality is, is and pollen quality is is very low, especially compared to a lot of our native plants. I have a post on my website that gives you a list of something like thirty or forty native plant species that are blooming before or at the same time as dandelion, and will provide far more flor floral rewards and resources for adult pollinating insects than a dandelion could ever hope to do. But dandelions are great with their roots breaking up compacted soil, helping water penetrate uh, down down deeper in case we have storm runoffs. Um, but yeah, just go ahead. I you know I, I've decided to let dandelions grow in 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 my beds. They don't really 
cause too much of an issue, but they are definitely not super beneficial for pollinators. Okay, that's a tricky question. <laughs> um, so if you if you have a lawn that is basically just lawn and there's nothing else in it, there's no there's no bad weeds like creeping Charlie or or any any other issues there, and it's just a very patchy lawn that's been stressed out and not maintained well, never aerated, not watered, then yes, scalp it, um, plant into it, sow into it. That's exactly what I did with my backyard. Those were the conditions I had. I just had a very stressed lawn that didn't have any weed pressure in it. Now if you have if you have a a, a a lawn that's really lush and and you want to put you want to put a garden in there there are several ways to do that from um, using plastic to using cardboard um, to using glyphosate to, to do a one-time treatment just to kill the grass and then, and then plant into that dead grass after two weeks um, that's the primary way we do our landscapes so don't till the soil yeah, just just don't. You're 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 destroying the soil structure, all the layers in there that help that help the soil do what it's doing. Um, you're bringing weed seeds to the surface. You're you're creating a wonderful bed for weeds. Um, yeah, it's going to be easier for you to plant if it's clay soil, but you're going to be creating far more headaches. Uh, when you're when you're putting in a new garden, the number one thing you want to do is try and reduce the amount of weeds you're going to have. Anytime you're doing a garden, you're creating a certain level of disturbance. So. My goal is always to have as little disturbance as I possibly can. And tilling is about the most violent disturbance I can possibly think of. Um, you do not want weed seeds to be fighting with your new plants that you spent a lot of, a lot of money on if, if you can help it. So yeah, I am not a tilling advocate to prep a bed. We've had major disasters with that. <laughs> I have no idea, next question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Google answer. Your Google search is as good as mine. It looks like that maybe was our last question for right now. So I'm just gonna go ahead and give everyone a reminder um, to go ahead and fill out that evaluation. Again, go under the speakers tab and if you go under Benjamin's part, you can find the direct link to that evaluation. Looks like we had one more before we get off here. Okay, sounds good. It's hard to dig into clay. How do you loosen it up? Uh, you plant. Plants are going to do that. Yeah, I know. I know it's hard to dig in clay. Again, some of the best tools are a, a soil knife that's going to be really sharp. And if you're using plugs, you're not going to have to dig very deep. Um, and there are there are resources to get plugs. Um, Isol Native Plants is actually a a distributor that works with native plant nurseries, including wholesalers, from the middle of the country all the way to the east coast. East coast, east, east coast, so that's I-Z-E-L, Isol Native Plants. So you can get plugs from them through their network of wholesalers. And so if you're just doing a plug, you're, you know, you're, you're digging maybe two, three, four inches down in the soil. If you're doing one gallon plants across a 500 foot bed, you're in trouble. You know, that's gonna be a lot of hard work. You gotta be a young buck to, to be able to take that. And that's certainly not me. So use a soil knife, um, use, use a spade with a D handle on the top or something like that. That's about three feet tall. Um, that's my best advice to you. We do most of our gardens by hand in clay and we're using soil knives and we're using plugs. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for our, um, this was our fourth session for the virtual Siouxland Garden Show. And remember to join us every Friday at 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. Central time. Um, every Friday until March 26th, we'll be having more sessions. Um, if you're interested to see what's coming up next, you can visit our Ceiling Garden Show website page. Um, and also feel free to browse the Facebook page. We'll have all the information there as well. Uh, Benjamin, thank you so much for joining us. And we hope to see everyone at our next session.